Welcome to Geeks of North, the hobby and gaming podcast on the Bob Provence. This week I'm here with Antoine, we have a couple topics for you. First up, we're going to talk about a new event we're running this fall, and secondly, we're going to talk to you about how you find opponents. So why don't you sit back, relax, grab a paintbrush, and enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeks of the North. As always, I'm your host, Paul Filio, here this week with the first and greatest of my co-hosts, Antoine Bergeron. Hey buddy, how's it going? <laughs> Pretty good, you? Pretty good. It's been a long time since we've done one of these uh, two-man shows. Yes, I don't remember when. Yeah, it's it's been a long time, but uh, that's cool because it should make the show uh, quick and nimble. <laughs> that remains to be seen. <laughs> well, you know, we could try. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this week we're going to talk about a few, uh, a couple different topics, shorter, smaller. Um, should be a uh, good distractions while people paint. Uh, but of course, uh, before we get to those main topics, we have all our usual stuff. So we have the cool stuff on the web. Uh, we have our hobby time and our games played. And then, um, I don't see a hobby tip of the episode in our notes. So we're going to skip that. And we're going to go right to our first topic. And uh, so we shall get the show on the road. And uh, first up, we'll do some cool stuff on the web. Antoine, what'd you find this week? Okay. Uh, I stumbled upon that. I don't remember if it was on Facebook or on Twitter first, but the artist that did all the Warmaster uh, giant layout or the page lay, the page bottom arts got back his art from Game Workshop. So he got all the originals. He picked them up and he has been posting uh, the pictures on Facebook. And I mentioned Warmaster because that's the one I... I saw first, but he got back arts for a bunch of different games, all by Game Workshop. So if you go through his page, uh, we'll be linking to the Game Workshop, uh, the Warmaster one. But uh, there are uh, arts for a ton of other games, and you get just the just the art piece, just the drawing or uh, or the painting. Uh, and I really love the Warmaster art because it really gives a a feel of the epicness of the giant battles that were happening in the old world. Yeah, and he's got a very, very cool style. Like, it's... The the art is... A lot of it's not clearly defined. Mm-hmm. You know, how to say that? It, it's not that it's... It's almost like a, a sketch in some ways. Yeah, kind of. It's, it, it's very cool. I, I think it, it really gives a lot of flavor. And... uh it suits because in some of the arts, like when they capture, let's say, orcs and stuff, th- there's a, s- a certain silliness to the art, which kind of conveys that that kind of look the orcs have in Warhammer Fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I, I think it's it's really well done. And I'd never seen this before because I've never seen Warmaster. Yeah. I, I remember when I picked up the book first time when it was released, what, early 2000s, something like that? The art, especially... Uh, Jump it at me. Uh, when you're in the post, uh, some of the latest one you have multiple per page. Those were the like the bottom pages. You had all text, and at the bottom of the page, you had a, a small action scene, either a, a faction rank or two faction uh, fighting one against each other. One was a dragon uh, breading flames and destroying the f- whole front rank of an army, and they were all just small pictures at just the bottom of the page, and. They looked so cool. They added team to the book. So seeing those again uh, and seeing the originals with the, the original colors, uh, I really loved, I really like those. I wish they were available as uh, prints. Well, if they gave the art back to him, I guess that means he has the rights to it now. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I've seen people ask, but I I never saw him answer. So well, it's probably maybe it's time case. to PM him. Maybe. <laughs> I'll see. Because that would be cool. Yeah. I Man, really I keep, would like... I keep, I keep looking at this Warmaster stuff. I really love small scale, right? And that's why it always killed me that Dystopian Wars never really went anywhere. I got into it really late. And uh, it was kind of like my chance to play a Warmaster style game. And oh. then it died locally. 
we both still have our stuff. And yeah, we, we and we talk about always doing something, and yet we never have. Yeah, because um, but, we always start on the other games. We just need yeah. to concentrate. Oh, yeah, that's going to happen. <laughs> um, but I, I really like the idea of War Master. Yeah. Oh, you know, my birthday's coming up. Maybe it'll be time to gift myself some some little men, some littler little men. <laughs> some tiny oh. men. That's right. Uh, um, so uh, I don't remember if I said the ar- artist's name. So it's uh, John Wiggly. I hope I didn't butcher his name too much. It looks like Wiggly. Yeah, Wiggly. W-I-G-L-E-Y. Yeah, and one of the comments on the art to, on the album is someone said best game ever and posted a picture of what I believe is probably Carl Franz on a Griffin. Yeah. Oh. Either car friends or uh, an Empire general. I, I yeah, don't know if it's the character or not. But. Yeah, it's hard to say. But um, it's just that looks cool. And I, since I know the size of it, I know how small it is. Yes. <laughs> the man who painted that did an excellent job, for one. But it looks so cool. And that's one thing I love. But because back in that days when we played Warmaster, uh, not Warmaster, but we played Warhammer, the monsters, and it, same thing for 40k, the scale was not true like the monster were not to scale with the troops sure they were bigger and same thing for the tanks but they were not in scale with the models that they were going along like the giants was big but it was ogre sized really <laughs> yeah yeah like, uh, the, the first the world released the game a giant that changed. was double the size or something like that. Nowadays, yeah. with the plastic and the bigger and big, bigger and larger kits, it's less the case. But back then, if you wanted monsters with a real epic scale compared to the troops, you had to look at Warmaster, the gi- the the giants, the I- the the dark elf yeah. Hydra, the the dragons. There, they were big. Yeah, I I totally understand what you're saying. So, uh, uh, some, some nostalgia, some artistic nostalgia for uh, yep. today's uh, cool stuff. And again, you tease me with the War Master, you evil man, you. All right, let's uh, let's talk some hobby, buddy. And uh, you know, it's a good thing that we don't record very often anymore, so it gives me a chance to actually make it look like I've done stuff. <laughs> um, because lately, I, I haven't been very prolific in my hobby, which is saying something. Because I'm the one of us that usually produces. Like either nothing or in giant quantity. Yeah. So <laughs> right you now I'm in one of those. Both. On I'm the nothing those, side? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um but yeah, so I was I was fairly prolific. Um I assembled uh we'll start off with some some guild balls. So I assembled Veteran Rage, uh Harry the Hat, Strongbox, Mist, and Snakeskin. Uh for those who don't know, those are union team players. And um what set that off is I picked up seasoned brisket at uh, Adepticon, and I was really uh, enamored with that model. So because of that, I'm like, well, I've got a bunch of Union models I bought for play with my other teams. So if I put them all together with her, I can I can make you know make a Union team. So I got her mostly painted up. Um, in the notes, I say she's painted, but she's not quite done. I, I never finished uh, her weapons. But the model itself is done, and she came out pretty nice uh, for the time I painted her. I mean, I, I just did it one evening, so it's a fairly quick job. Uh, and then while I was away on business last week, I actually took my painting stuff with me, and I painted Mist. Or started painting her. Him. It. I think it's a him. Him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I have to say, those models, uh, it, it's one of the original sculpts, and it's got a a limited edition one that looks so much better. Yes. Um, but it, it's still a decent model, except for the way it's designed to mount to the base. Oh, yeah. Because he's, he's, he's kind of like pain. gliding, right? And he's got um, the tiniest ankles ever. Like, he makes original Infinity models look robust. <laughs> and by, by painting him, I've actually bent him off. Like, he's going to pop off. He's going to break off the base. I, I know it. it. It's only a matter of time. So now the trick is, how do I pin him? Yeah. Because yeah. his leg is so thin. Yeah. And he only has one foot on the base, right? On the ground. Yes, yeah. exactly. 
it's retarded. I'm basically going to uh, shove a pin into his butt and pretend I don't see it, and that'll be the end of it. It'll just be pinned right through his ass to the base. <laughs> Good to go. Um, I assembled nope. it, but uh, I no longer have it. Uh, Steve as my uh, original version. I have the uh, limited edition one now. Yeah, Steve, Steve uh, broke it off at the ankle, oh, yeah, and then <laughs> pinned it to the base, and then uh, hid the foot in a bush. Uh, that, that's a solution. <laughs> so he's standing in a bush, which is also a possibility for me. It, it, it could happen. Maybe I'll just uh, make a big, uh, like crater around him and I'll fill it with resin and make him standing in a puddle. <laughs> I'll do a little variant. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so I, I've started painting him and I've got, uh, he's probably 85% done. But one thing I found is I'm painting him in the, uh, the original union color scheme, the kind of gray and dark red. And while it looks okay in the art, it's pretty boring on the models. Because it's very dark. So I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to stick with that scheme. It worked okay on Brisket. Uh, because she's got like a vest. And there's like, so her arms are showing. She's got all kinds of pouches and leather showing. So there, there's still things to break up the color on her. Plus she has bright red hair and the light skin. So I still found there was uh, enough variance in the in the the color on her. That when you look at her on the table, she doesn't kind of wash out. Mm-hmm. But with Mist, because he's he's got a, a giant cloak and, you know, dark gloves, dark boots, his face is in shadow, he, he, he kind of doesn't look like much from three feet away, you know? Yeah, so I, I, I can I, see that. I, I may have to fiddle a little bit. Um, You know, uh, I'll ask Yom how to throw some OSL on it or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, What else did I do? Oh, yeah. So we talked about uh, 3D Wargaming. Yes, um, we did in the past. Yeah, yeah in the past. And it's a. Uh, and uh, and for those I'll who don't be know it. Talking about those again today. <laughs> oh, it's true. Um, so 3D Wargaming uh, makes files that you can purchase for a very, very reasonable price um, for a bunch of different tanks and stuff. And you can print them up on a 3D printer. So. I bought the files for T34 to try out, um, and I have access to some 3D printers. So I've printed, I don't know, three, four of them or whatever. And these are 28 mil scale, so like bolt action sized. Um, and and pretty, uh, T34 is a Russian thing for, for yeah. World War II. Yeah. And uh, I'm pretty happy with the print quality, the way it came out. There's some fine tuning. Sadly, my, my printer is a MakerBot, uh, one of the newer ones. And when you're 3D printing, you, you and, th- and this is the part that most people don't un- understand or realize, 3D printers that work uh, with a filament, uh, FDM, they're called, there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference in resolution between a $3,000 MakerBot and a $500, you know, Chinese knockoff whatever printer from, from Amazon. If they're both properly calibrated, they output very similar end results. One of the things that does make a difference between printers is the software you use that takes the 3D model and slices it into layers and works the creates the tool path for the machine to print in. The MakerBot printer I have access to uses a custom software solution that is uh, proprietary. So you cannot use any other slicer software. And it works pretty well, and it printed the tanks, uh, I would say, very well overall. But it has trouble with the main cannon on the T-34 for some reason. Just the main cannon. The turret yeah, is fine, true. the bodies you, are fine. You mentioned that. And you have other smaller parts that it prints without a problem. Perfectly. You have little machine guns, little tiny machine guns on the front of the tank. No problem. But that main gun is an issue. And I've done probably 40 of them to try to get like different print settings and I've got all kinds of different iterations of the, uh, the print file saved. So like, I know which ones work best. And the thing is I don't even get consistent results between like, if I print the same file twice, I sometimes get variation in how it prints, which is really strange. Um, so out of like the 30 I've done, I've got four or five ones that I find acceptable that I can, with a little bit of green stuff, I can make them perfect. 
Um, but aside from that, I, I'm really happy with the models. And, uh, you know, if you've got access to a 3D printer, the materials are very cheap. Um, you, you can buy a spool of filament on Amazon, like decent filament, um, in uh, PLA, which is a, a biodegradable plastic, for about $25. If you're not picky on the color. So that's for a kilo. And depending on how you make the tanks, uh, you'll probably get, I can see 10, 15 tanks out of a, out of a roll. So it makes it pretty affordable, which is nice. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun playing. I, I, you know, it, learning something new is always fun and 3d printing while it's been out for a long time. It's, it's a lot of tweaking, a lot of fine tuning. So it's, it's a learning experience. So that was a lot of fun to play with. Uh, Moving on to some more traditional stuff, I assembled a bunch of Menoth Jacks, uh, Redeemers, Reckoners, um, for uh, a list I decided I'll probably never play, because I looked at it and went, wow, that won't be fun for anyone to play against. <laughs> <laughs> so you well, assembled them before starting to think about the list and not playing no, it again? No, I, I thought about the list, and I was like, okay, this could really work. And then I... I I looked at it, like, so I assembled all the models, I bought all the models, assembled everything, got it ready to go, and then it dawned on me that, you know, I don't play the game to win top of turn two, raffle stomp someone, and make them not want to play anymore. That's not my goal. So, and and not only that, the list would get very boring. The, the premise of the list was basically, uh, it uses a caster whose uh, feat is a knockdown, it's Krios 1. So he does a, a really big knockdown feat. A pop and drop. Yeah, the pop and drop. When everyone's going to be like, yeah, it was going to be the other can just shake it off. But you can only shake it off if you survive long enough to do it. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's the problem. Because then I had something like 15 or 16 templates I could drop on your army. Yeah. And uh, that's just not not fun for anyone. So I figure I'll probably never play that list. Except maybe against you. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. I wouldn't even do that to you. Even he doesn't deserve that. Um, sorry, we hadn't made fun of him in the last 10 minutes, so I had to, I had to get in there. Uh, aside from that, I assembled some Signar. Um, in, in honor of Yom, I decided to get my Signar out of the boxes I've had them in for the last five years and uh, build them all. So I assembled a, a storm wall. Uh, which is the colossal, uh, a couple chargers, a couple fireflies, a couple hunters, and I stripped uh, a couple of defenders that I'd painted years ago. Oh, and I built um, what is that other Jack? Uh, Stormclad, a uh, Stormclad as well. And then uh, I've been spending a lot of free time doing lists for War Machine. I'm going to count that <laughs> as hobby. Because with the amount yeah. of stuff you assembled, uh, I can see why you've been uh, doing dojo. <laughs> yeah, lots and lots of list dojo, uh, and and it's led to some some fun lists. Uh, and actually, I tried one of them last night, but I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, yeah, that, that's and that's it for my hobby. So I, I I've done a fair amount of assembly, not a whole lot of painting. Um, and I've done some buying. I did I did some more buying today, but. We, I'll save that for next time. Uh, yeah, for games played. I, I don't have much going. I played a game of Guild Ball against you, uh, but I'll let you talk about that. And I, I played a game of War Machine with Yom. And uh, it went well, uh, in the sense that it was a good game. Uh, it went well for Yom in the sense that he beat the pants off me. <laughs> uh, but it was a fun list. So I, uh, <laughs> I lost to his bottom of the barrel list. So he's playing in a bottom of the barrel tournament where you have to basically take your worst caster. Um, now luckily Signar, even their worst caster is not that bad and they have enough good supporting units that you, you can make a lot of stuff work. Yeah. Uh, like um, you said, the, the caster might be bad. The rest of the army isn't. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, it was a, uh, actually, I don't know if it was in, in tier. It probably was. I would guess it was in, uh, Storm Division. It was probably Storm Division, now that I think about it. So it was... Uh, Connie Connie B, as Yom calls her. So Constant Plays. Uh, she had uh, Gallant on her. 
She had, uh, there was, well, I don't know who had what. There was Thorn in the list. There was a Firefly. He had uh, Runewood, Stormblades. Um, what's the cavalry called? Stormlances. Stormlances. Uh, Ladder War. Yeah, it must have been Storm Division. A couple of, I think he had one or two Stormblade Captains and a Squire. Yeah, that was probably most definitely Storm Division. Um, I was playing a non-tiered Kador list. Uh, I had a Conquest on Vlad 1. And then I had two Jack Marshall Destroyers that were on the new... Oh, uh, the, 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 the new Golden Lord Solo Man of War guy. Whose name I can't even recall. Can you remember what that thing is called? Nope. Wow, I suck. This makes good radio while I get more room open, because it's going to drive me nuts if I don't uh, come up with the name. Anyway, so I had two of those guys. Uh, I had uh, Reinhold Goblin Speculator on Vlad, in case Yom had something that was, you know, stealthy, which of course he didn't, but I didn't know that in advance. I had Gorman DeWolf for smoke screens and acid and blind and all that fun stuff. I had a field gun for auto knockdown on hit, which is always joyous. And I had a uh, a battle wagon, a gun carriage. Sorry. The guy you were looking for is probably the Grey Lord Forge Seer. Yes, that's exactly it. Thank you. And I think that's it. I killed um, I killed a lot of his stuff. Yeah, that was the whole list. That was seventy five points. So obviously no tier because I had mercenaries in there and everything else. Um. And we're playing the pre-CID version of the the battle wagon. So it's the, the kind of poopier version of the gun carriage. Mm-hmm. It's still pretty good, but not as good as the CID version. Yeah. Um, we're playing the scenario with uh, three flags, e- evenly spaced along the middle of the table. We have one point for... Con- could be. One point for controlling or dominating the flag. Mm-hmm. Um a couple things happened in this game. Uh, one, I kept... <laughs> we were playing with flat terrain, which I don't normally do, and I kept forgetting it was there. <laughs> so I'd be like, when I shoot that guy? And Yom's like, well, he's got plus two defense. Like, why? Well, he's on a hill. Like, what? Oh. I'm just going to run over here. Oh, wait, is this water? Yeah, this is water. Oh. Well, I guess I won't run through that. I'll uh, go around it. <laughs> so there's a bunch of, like, odd stuff like that. Um, Yeah, I, I killed his... um. Storm, what do we call them? Storm lances. So I killed all the storm lances. I killed Lattermore. I killed, I think, Thorn um, and one of his other light jacks. I uh, put a lot of damage on Constance. She had about six boxes left. Uh, but in the end, he won um, on uh, uh, control points. I, I'd forgotten. I've been listening and reading so much about. Um, Steamroller 2017, that I forgot that there was a five point limit in 2016, which is what we were playing. So he got the five points and he's like, okay, I win. I'm like, what do you mean you win? Like, I'm not dead. There's no, uh, I look at the clock. I'm like, oh, I've only got 30 seconds on the clock. Yeah, yeah. He's like, well, no, I get five points this turn. And I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that five point thing. But, um, it was a good game, uh, a lot of fun. And it was an interesting list. It didn't have a lot of models for me. But I was surprised at how effective it was. Like it, it, it had enough AOEs and pressure that it could apply. That it was, it was a fairly interesting list to play. Uh, and Jack Marshall's, especially that one, are are a lot better than I thought. It was the first time I'd ever played with Jack Marshall's. So they have some pretty decent abilities. The fact that he can give a focus to a Jack, and the fact that he makes all the Jack's attacks uh, magical and blessed against Signar, not so bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially blessed. The, the magical yeah. part doesn't really yeah, matter. But, but but blessed is important, right? Arcane shield. What yeah. arcane shield? Yeah. So it was uh it was pretty good. And the, the new rules for the Jack Marshall seems interesting. Yeah. The thing is, you know, you still end up with jacks that are kind of underpowered in some ways, or they're a little bit starved. Luckily with signs importance from Vlad and the one focus, like it, with the Jack Marshall's abilities, it, it didn't really feel like my Jacks were were underpowered, mm-hmm. which was nice. 
It's the goal. And you put them there if you have the support to make them work. Yeah. Well, I was just going for lots of shooty, lots of templates. And uh, I, mean, I had lots of templates. I mean, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine templates. Uh, 10, 11, if you, if, I think, I think the, uh, the Forge here can throw sprays too. Actually, it's not spray, it's just a regular dark damage. Um, but yeah, so th there's enough templates going around that it's, it's, you know, wee! <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, that was it for my games. Uh, how about you, Antoine? Uh, on the Ubi side first, I finished a couple of models that were on my table for a long time. I finished um, Boar for my uh, Butchers for Guild Ball, and I finished Virus for Pulp City. Both had been on my painting table, partially painted for three to six months, maybe. <laughs> is Virus a monkey? Yeah, yeah. Virus is one of uh, one of my... Uh, it's a spider monkey to go with me, my ARC. Awesome. Yeah, the small, uh, it's a small support model that works uh, with the... One of the type they call they are uh, uh, power power power. I don't remember the name, but they have uh, bigger models. Most of them are on fifty millimeter bases, and those don't provide their own uh, action points. Uh, they're powerhouse, and how it works is they yeah, the, 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 the really, supermans. Yeah, they yeah. hit really really hard, but they don't provide. Uh, resources in the game and that's right usually you bring other models that can provide more resource than they use to power your powerhouse in the case of the arc the one of the support piece is virus and it's pretty special because both virus and um, a butt which is the uh, arc powerhouse they both have rules that target directly the other one so virus doesn't really make sense to bring in a game if you don't have a butt and a butt is limited if you don't bring virus, which is not the case for the other powerhouse in the other list. So it limits yeah. a bit the list versatility because you kind of have to bring both. But they are fun to play together. So I'm happy yeah, at I, least I'm, half of the combo is now painted. I'm looking at the bottle for, for virus. He's hilarious. He's basically a little spider monkey wearing like cargo pants and a Hawaiian shirt. Yep. So it's pretty awesome. And eight bot looks pretty good. You know, I I didn't give Pulp City a, a fair shake in terms of models. I, I think the the more recent stuff has gotten a lot better in terms of sculpts. I'm happy to say that <laughs> because if you finally uh, look at them and find enough that you might like, you might want to play it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I I when I tried it, I really liked the game. I did a demo uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, we, we mentioned we talked about that. I don't know if we talked about that in the show. By before, but you you like the rules. You just don't really uh, like the models, or enough to to play the game. You know, I'm I'm looking at stuff, and there there was some cool models, but it wasn't quite enough. Mm -hmm. But looking at what they've got now, like Amok and stuff, or mm -hmm. Amok, and it's not like you need a lot. Most game you need from four to eight models, maybe, and you're not limited to faction. All, as and long as they're either all from the same faction or all from the same alignment, so all neutral or evil or, or neutral and good, or, so yeah. you have a lot of list building options. You're not so, limited. You can go however you want. A way of the fist and blade. That was actually one of the factions I'd looked at before. So, yeah. Man, there's a lot of neat ones now. I look at another one called the uh, Antian. Mm hmm. He looks wicked awesome. He looks almost like a Viking or something. He's like a cross between He Man and Odin. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what he looks like. Oh, screw you, Antoine. Oh, You're all I... like, look at this game. Look at this. Really, if you start that game, I'll be so happy because it's one of my favorite game right now. It. it... Uh, well, the fact that you can fully interact with the world is really neat. Yeah, you throw buildings, you throw people in them, you can... Uh, <laughs> you know, grab a dumpster, pick it up, throw it at someone. Like. Yeah. It's so fun. 
it's so dynamic Are and it plays on such a small it table feels like a, an action movie or and can you imagine playing this with 80 percent g because he also has models for this game you know yes i know and he's animated you could take the most boring game ever and he has to act out everything his models do can you imagine what he's going to be like with this that would be fun playing a, a three or four player game uh, yeah yeah Hmm. We'll have to we'll have to talk more out of the outside the show. Ah, yes. <laughs> You're starting to get War Master more, Pulp City more. Wow. <laughs> we even yeah, talked like... about the disappearing more again. Uh, it, it's it's my birthday show, it seems. <laughs> okay. After that, uh, I did a lot of cleaning and assembly. Well, I say a lot, but uh, after you, uh, I I did a bit. So I cleaned up and glued a veteran ox for my butchers. I cleaned up a mist speaker for ords, for uh, the minions, and also uh, Red Bella for Pulp City. And I also cleaned and partly assembled uh, Dexterius and I Wayne for Ariana Rex. That's the rider with the horse uh-huh. for uh, Legio 13. And that's it for assembly. Yeah. Uh, I did some painting on Minx for Francois, a local player. Uh, a friend, a buddy, we're doing uh, some uh, trade. I'm trading a paint job for a boat from the Kickstarter for uh, Blood and Plunder. One of the resin uh, boat. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I also started cleaning a Dark Eldar Ar- Archon. Archon? Archon? Archon, yeah. Archon for uh, Albatar conversion. Um, English speaker will be uh, Captain Arlock? Yes. Okay, yeah. Doing a Captain Arlock Dark Eldar Archon conversion for uh, a guy in Montreal. And the last item in the hobby, I painted a couple of tanks for 3D Wargaming. So you mentioned them earlier. So I got a Tiger and a T-34 from them to paint for the to print for them for uh, their, their when they do shows and uh, for the the websites this was my first foray into historical painting and i must be honest after painting those i'm starting to look at an historical well historical game or almost historical maybe uh, what's conflict 47 or yeah. dust or whatever uh, any mean any reason to paint more historical uh it's not exactly the same style as painting sci-fi or uh it, it's something fantasy. different right yeah and, and you can weather it up and it's and i enjoyed it quite a bit I, I haven't painted that much vehicles in the past and all that weathering was really fun i never really weather do i don't do much battle damage yeah, and this was my first time really uh, jumping into it, and I really enjoyed it. About some of the uh, new withering effects from Valio to uh, do part of it, mix of pigments, lots of oil, uh, lots of uh, controlled wash, glaze, everything, and really liked it. So uh, they were a blast to paint, and they came out fantastic. I mean, you did an excellent job, even. Uh I I'd, I'd showed them off to uh, a friend of mine, James Wapple, who's a, a pretty well-known painter in the States. And he does a lot of historical stuff, and he thought they were super well done. So, yeah. was a nice uh, hearing that from him. <laughs> yeah, well... And, and they were fast to paint. I, I was... That's another thing. I I took less time on that than I thought for results that I find really good. I could have well, gone a lot more in depth in the weathering, but I think they it's a good level where I start. It's about a balance too, right? Because yeah. you can keep going, but then you have to worry about doing too much, right? Too much of a good thing. Yes. And yeah. then people stop looking at the model as a whole and all they see is a bunch of weathering. Mm-hmm. Like that could really happen too. So no, I, I think uh I I think you chose the the right place to stop. Yeah. So looking forward to more of those. Uh, and with the <laughs> with the 40k craze right now, uh, with the eighth edition coming, uh, we might try it out in in the group. That might be a reason to paint more vehicles too. 
So uh, Imperial then, Guard. Uh, well, <laughs> even just the Doom Crawlers for uh, uh, my uh, skilleries would be a, a a good place to start. There's less uh, type of withering to apply on a Mars <laughs> March unit, but uh, I could build up another uh, what Forge World than Mars maybe to have a uh, more yeah, withering uh, possibilities. We'll see. That's very true. So that's it for my hobby. On the game side, I played a War Machine game against Mathieu Serrois, uh, one of our listeners. He was at Kias Ludic for the casual tournament, and he won, <laughs> air quote, the wooden spoon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, to so, me, so wooden, wooden spoon means last place, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a last place. It's an award that dates from uh, the UK. Some they they gave that to wow. Aviron team. They had a, a wooden Aviron that they gave to the last place, and it, it descends from there. Yeah, I have one. I'm the proud owner of a wooden spoon. Yeah. <laughs> so he won one of the wooden spoon, but he had to leave early. So we had a wooden spoon in our in the stuff after we. Uh, we picked up the the venue, and so I, I met with him, played a game. So my pigs again is uh, Kador. Had some fun with the uh, rule book scenario, some something uh, simple, and uh, I gave him his wooden spoon back. <laughs> yeah, he time. played the, he played Sorsha. Which one? Uh, Sorsha one, the uh, the basic uh, caster. She is one of the best in Kador, right? Mm-hmm. She she's one of the scariest casters they have. If I remember correctly, that's the only caster he has. Oh, wow. So he's he's really a, a new player. Uh, he's been playing for at least a couple of years, I think, but he doesn't play that much. And he hasn't invested in tons and tons of stuff. So he paints what he has and builds slowly on it. So he was looking at uh, trying out new casters. Don't know which for which he went, but uh, I was playing... Uh, Arcadius. So, uh, lots of pigs against uh, Kedor. Was fun. We I also played a game of Guild with you. Uh, yes, you did. Sousal, at the I, basement. I, I still hurt. I still uh, hurt. Ah, it wasn't that bad. The 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 thing that hurts probably the most is uh, uh, my dice abandoning me, missing that goal, that goal kick. I missed a couple gold kicks in that game, and it was it was pretty depressing. Yeah, let me tell you, for the uh, ball handling team, uh, <laughs> I don't know where my team was, but they weren't on the field that night. Yeah, it, no. or they were hung over from the night before. I, I don't know. But well, uh, they tried. You did one goal, and if Shark had they didn't did try enough, his, <laughs> you would have been away enough to not be killed the the turn the following turn, and it would have been a, a lot more close. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, it wasn't a bad game at all. Um, I, I did okay. I it just, it was one of those games where truly my dice abandoned me. Yes. I, I'm not saying I lost because of dice, but they didn't help. <laughs> no, they sure <laughs> Leave didn't. Leave it at that. I mean, I'm, I'm a big enough man to admit that your skill level is much higher than mine, but, uh, yeah, <sighs> my dice, it was, it was, I hurt. Yeah. It was. It scarred bad. me. It, it was bad. That's why I think that's why I started building my union. That's the real reason. Like <laughs> to, to switch, <laughs> make, make it some change from playing yeah, exactly. fisherman all the time. <laughs> time for a change. Yeah. And my the last game I played is a game of War Master with uh, against Benoit once again. Uh, we were playing one of the I don't know if they were in the War Master or one of the War Master magazines. Uh, a scenario called the Curse Fortress. So you have two spots on the table, two main spots. One is like a a orb or an enchantment somewhere in a, a small zone in the middle. And once you ac- you activate that by leaving a unit there, it opens up uh, a fortress that's hidden and that you can start attacking because there's a defensive force there. And you can take the fortress. So... Uh, activating the the small orb give you some victory points. Taking the fortress give some victory points, and killing the, each other also give victory points. We ended up the game never even approaching the fortress, and only unlocking it like the turn before the end at seven 
at the sixth or seventh turn. So it was just a big grind. <laughs> I was playing my dwarf. Benoit was playing his Dogs of War. And I must say, I really, really like Warmaster. Dogs of War is like a mercenary army, right? Exactly. Yeah, he usually play empires, but he got a bunch of other troops from... Um, he has the Battle of the Five Armies uh, a 10-meter game that Game Workshop did. So that comes with uh, dwarves, that comes with uh, small uh, goblin wolf riders, and a bunch of troops that can fill up an empire list to become a Dogs of War list, almost. So he was using his, pi- uh, his uh, Albargers as pikemen instead. The, because the uh, the dogs of war list comes with pikemen instead of all barriers, but that's close enough. I mean. Yeah, close enough. They usually they're not uh, ranked the same way. They're the pikemen are ranked facing the the small side of the base, but he was just playing them sideways, and it didn't really matter. So, and uh, it, that way he was able to play a, a bigger list. So we played thirteen, thirteen hundred, I think. So 1,300 points, how many stands of models did you have? Because uh, that doesn't sound like a lot of models, but I mean, I, I only know Warhammer Fantasy and, and 40k, right? So 1,300 points doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot. I probably had 10 units of infantry, uh, 3 War Machine, and 2 characters. Oh, okay. So it's a pretty big game. Yeah, I, I think the regular, like... Uh, tournament level and that's with quotes but uh to be honest there's a a, a, a warmaster scene is getting back up uh in the uk and the, uh, europe with the um the warmaster revolution now mm-hmm. so they're running tournaments uh at least every other month almost and getting 16 player plus so uh the game is getting back <laughs> that's cool <laughs> but the the regular size they play is 2000 Okay, so much bigger. Yeah. I own almost 3,000 points of Dwarf, at, I think. And that's almost before adding a magic, up, uh, magic items 3, and stuff like that. Yeah, I bought... Uh, now, if you look for out-of-print Warmaster stuff, it cost a lot. But for a while, everybody was just discarding them. So I got that for 100 bucks, I think. And selling that now... That would probably be uh, almost a thousand. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah. Perchance, a lot of companies, uh, other companies are doing 10 millimeter uh, fantasy stuff. Yeah. They, they don't do so. exactly uh, exact proxies for everything in all list, but uh, you can manage to find uh, most of them now. So you don't have to look for the super pricey Game Workshop uh, out of prints. And you can go for uh, either Magister, Militum, or Militum, something like that. Uh, Calistra, there's a bunch of people. Yeah, Magister, Militum. Yeah. Um, the uh, the Evil Men we talked about a couple of episodes Hendrick. ago. Hendrick they do uh, Chaos Troops. Uh, Trolls Under the Bridge do some too. So there's a bunch of ca- companies who do them. So. No, it's. it's uh... It's good to see 10 millimeter gaming coming back. Cause yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting format because you can do so much because mm-hmm. the models aren't huge, right? Yeah. I, I didn't paint them much yet. I, I did uh, one unit of warriors and a, a stand of slayers. But, uh, once I'm done with the, the stuff I have to finish right now, the, the convert, the, uh, the commissions and one of the a model I picked, uh, for my pigs, I, I I bought the the battle engine, the meat treasure. Once yeah. those are done, I'll probably uh, go back to Pulp City and uh, Warmaster for painting. Warmaster paints quickly, so uh, it would be funny. The, you see the impact quickly in your army because it fills up, and they're fast to paint, <laughs> a lot faster than most of the uh, larger scale stuff I do. I don't try to do. Uh, super blending on 10 meter. I did that on 15 <laughs> with the Chronicle stuff. <laughs> I, I won't do that on 10. <laughs> well, come on. Yeah, yeah, come on. Yeah, no, no way. <laughs> There's no painting on this for 10 millimeter right now. And I'm fine with that. Ah, <laughs> uh, chicken. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. 
So is that it? Yes, that's it. Okay. So why don't we take a, a quick break and then come back with our main topics? So we'll be right back, geeks. And we're back. All right. So, uh, first of our two main topics, Antoine. The uh, the big reveal. <laughs> yeah. So, a um, little backstory. Uh, listeners will know that I, I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years going to different events in the States. Uh, Depticon, ReaperCon, um, TempleCon. And... Uh, Having gone to, to ReaperCon a couple times, I, I really found the format of the event pretty spectacular. And I loved the sense of community when I was there. And I thought it would be really cool if we could do something um, like that here, locally. Because we have a lot of talented artists locally. And we have a lot of people who like to paint. So I'm like, what if we bring these people together where the artists can can help people develop some skills and we can, you know, paint together as a, as a community and have a fun event and do a little of a little open painting um, contest. And uh, Antoine and I talked about it on and off. And then uh, finally, we decided to, to make it happen. And borrowing from a from a name from something that we used to do, or that Antoine's group used to do, the uh, Club Chaos, we, we stole the name for an event called... Uh, Couleur en monde. So, color your world. What? You're laughing at me and I'm not sure why. Just the French pronunciation was funny. Oh, color ton monde. <laughs> well, sorry, yeah, yeah. I added a U in there that wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> uh, yeah, you threw me all off now. Yeah. My whole so, thing. Anyway, so, you so mentioned color ton that. Monde. Yeah. Uh, uh, because there's a lot of gaming events around here. Lots of smaller tournaments, uh, store events, uh, Chaos League that we run, uh, the end the open, but even Quebec City Open, that's going to be our second or third year this year. But all of those are centered around the gaming part of the hobby, not the uh, artistic part. So that, that was something that's missing. That, that's something that's missing here. So we started looking at how we could run something that would help people um, develop some skills and and get out and paint together and do something fun. And uh, we we quickly realized that it was not going to be uh, easy. <laughs> I think. Um, and you know, there's the usual issues, finding space, uh, you know, how, how are we going to let people know about it? How are we going to encourage people to come out? How much are we going to have to charge to make this happen? And is, are, are people going to be willing to pay it? Mm-hmm. Right. So there's been a lot of, um, a lot of challenges just to get to the, uh, a realistic planning stage. Right. And, um, <laughs> Sorry. I just saw something for the next topic and it caught my eye and I completely misread it. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, so, uh, you know, we, we've done a lot of the initial, the initial steps. Uh, we went and looked at a space this week. Mm-hmm. Um, Some real nice think, space. Yeah. I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, so, so what are people, and the other thing we had to talk about, of course, the finding the space and, and pricing was, what are people going to do when they get there? Like, what type of event are we going to make this? Yeah. So, so, what we want people to do is we want people to paint. We want people to share. We want people to look at stuff and uh, learn new techniques and everything. So, 
we are following what, as you said, the Reaper format, ReaperCon format, quite, yeah, quite close to, to what they do. So er, the main stage is getting everyone in a room, everybody in a room and have them painting. So we'll have a big general painting idea, area, area, and where they can sit, chat, paint. We'll have a, uh, water plates, everything that people need to paint. And we are looking for a well-lit room so that it, you don't have to bring your portable lamp if you don't want to, but you can if you want. <laughs> yeah. And we want also access to uh, uh, people who, uh, who know more about painting. So I'll let you know about that setup. Like, yeah, we want uh, the who want to have classes or at least specific topic approach. But we also want uh, those people who are in the know to be uh, approachable by everybody, not just have them sitting in class all day. Yeah. And, and that's one of the great strengths of ReaperCon that we stole. Um, so at ReaperCon, you can go and you can pay uh, a fee to take a, a, a class with a few other people, say 10 other people or whatever, um, with a specific uh, teacher on a specific topic. So we're going to offer something like that. So if you want to take, uh, and I'm going to use this as an example, a um, OSL class with Yom, then you can do that. You'll pay a nominal fee, and you'll do a two-hour class with Yom. And from but there, when, you will do too much OSL on all your models. Yes, everything will be glowing. You'll have to wear sunglasses when playing your games. Um, but then when Yom is not in that class, he will be sitting at a head table in a room with the other artists who aren't in a class. And he'll be there to give advice, to give pointers, to give critiques and commentary, uh, and, and to help everyone else. And, and I think it's going to really help people level up. Because it's one thing to randomly talk to someone on Facebook or to see that they're a good painter, but it's another to actually be able to interact with them. And see their model for real, be able yep. to see all the angles, show them your stuff, because we don't have, uh, we don't all have good uh, lighting setups for cameras and pictures. So it's not easy to, it's not that, e it's easy to share on the web. It's not easy to share uh, representative pictures of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And even people who've been doing pictures of their models for years don't necessarily take great pictures. Like we often tease Yom a little bit that some of his photos are not the 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 best for his model. Um though he has gotten significantly better. <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, it it was something we, we often picked on him about because you know, like, you know, your models look great, but your pictures don't do them justice. Um and and you know, by having everyone there, I, I think and because different Instructors have different skill sets. You'll be able to get a lot of information about different aspects of your model, um, you know, different points of view. So you can really work on a lot of different areas of, of painting. Mm -hmm. And and we're looking at keeping costs low, right? Do we want to discuss a little bit, Antoine, kind of, kind of the price we're aiming at? We can. Uh, and and, and a okay, big caveat. Uh, that, caveat that... Those are not final. We're still yeah. working out uh, the price. Th these are our goals. Yeah. Right? And and I'm not going to talk about what the class costs are, because I, I think we need to discuss that with, um, we, with, with the, the artists. different teachers and artists. Yeah. And, it, and it's going to depend on materials and stuff required for the class. Mm -hmm. But yeah. we were looking... Um, so something around uh, yeah we're aiming at because we have two formats for the event we're not sure which one we're going for yet we either want to do a single day long day format let's say from nine in the morning to nine in the afternoon uh, nine in the evening yeah or two over two days but do shorter days like 10 to 5 or something like that yeah so that's one big question that remains to be uh, determined. But depending on what format we want, we're aiming at something maybe 20 to 25 bucks per day, depending on, on a short or long day. And something around 
30, 35 for the whole weekend, maybe. If we yeah. do a two day event, if you pay for a, a two day pass. Yeah. So the event will be extremely affordable. And um, your ticket will also include a, uh, a swag bag. Mm hmm. Um, and we are aiming uh, to give you back, uh, you know, equal value of useful product or savings in the swag bag to what you paid for the attendance. Yeah. And right? we're doing so if, that with, uh, with sponsors for sure. Yeah. So if you pay $25 or $30 for an entry, you will get, the goal is that you will get at least that back in, in value. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and that exactly, that's going to be thanks to our sponsors. Um, that's not all you get. So when you get, you pay your ticket, you get your entry to the general painting area. You get access to the the the, the artist in the uh, Ed row, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, you get the swag bag, but you'll also get well f access to uh, registering for classes. Those are extra payments, like we mentioned. We yeah. don't have the final process in those the, because we need to uh, pay the artist and we need to pay for mat specific materials for yeah. the, those classes. But I, you well, also, I will say, yeah. I will say, what we'd like to have classes. Um, as low as 10 to $15. Yeah. There may be more expensive classes than that, but there will be entry level classes at that price. And we're talking like a, a two, two and a half hour class. It's not an all day thing. So you can still benefit from the rest of the event, mm -hmm. but you get a specific class targeted, a specific technique. Um, where, uh, you know, and again, the goal is model provided, like materials provided in the cost of the class. So if you take a, a 10 or $15 class, well, you will get a model as well. So not only will you get the knowledge, but you'll get your whatever you worked on in the class to take with you. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of that, we uh, in the intro you mentioned a painting contest. So we want to run mm -hmm. uh, a smallish open format contest. Uh, we will probably get our the uh, the main artists, the teachers, out of it, <laughs> and they will. Uh, yeah. Be uh, be there as judge for the event. We want to get to make the event available to any level of painters, and that's also making the uh, the painting contest uh, accessible to everyone by not having to face uh, like if, if we keep locally like Faust or Yom or uh, Matsu. Yeah. If he, if he ever yeah. showed up, and and I think the if, if we follow the Reaper. Um, guidelines exactly the, the the grading of the contest first off it's, it's an open contest so it's not a podium format where you're you're trying to go for number one right it's you're trying to produce the best thing you can produce yep and then you're graded on your your techniques and the um the artistic value of the of the piece whatever depending on the category and depending on how we decide and this is all very vague we haven't really decided everything um but, you know, a, a model, and again, this is not like a, a master's painting competition. So, you know, if you, if you get a gold, it'll mean you have smooth blends, excellent lighting. You maybe you do some OSL, you're using some really advanced techniques and you applied them well. It does not necessarily mean that you're going to go out and win a crystal brush next year, but it means that you've got all the advanced techniques and a good understanding of how to apply them. And I'm going to use martial arts as an example, Right. There's a lot of people with black belts out there. Not every black belt is the same. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? A black belt in martial arts means that you have mastered all the all the techniques, all the basic techniques. That does not mean that you're the you're you're the best at them. It just means you've mastered them. So I, I think uh you know a painting contest like this can encourage people and reward them for effort at the same time. And and hopefully encourage people to, to improve for next year. Um because we'd like to keep running this. Yeah. The, the goal is right. to have an annual event. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I've seen this style of painting competition do some really great things at ReaperCon. And I think we can really benefit from something like it here for... I mean, we, ha we have a premier painting contest, right? Yes, with uh, Figure in Quebec. Figure in Quebec. But that's, that's more of a, a master's competition. Yeah. In we, all honesty. We will use a similar format, the open format. 
but we're aiming it at uh, a more gamer level painters. Yeah. Um, so it, it, that'll give us basically a painting contest for everyone between yeah. the two of them, which is good. Uh, uh, on top of that, we are looking at maybe running more uh, like fun events, like maybe some uh, speed painting uh, <laughs> yeah. contest. Uh, maybe some in class uh, intro class to painting for kids. Yep. So for, maybe daddy wants to come to the, to one of the two days, but you know, you, daddy's got the kids. Well, you know, that's okay. We'll have activities that can keep the kids interested while, while daddy or mommy <laughs> is, is, you know, learning some more advanced techniques from one of the teachers or taking a class or whatever. You know, we're, we're trying to make it really an, an inclusive event. Yeah. And I, we're trying to go for a decent size. I, I think our, our goal we're in that 50 to 60 person target, I think is really what we're going for, for a first event. Yeah. We're, we're prepared to do more than that, but that's kind of like our minimum. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good way to say that. That's a good minimum. Uh, I think we're aiming for maybe 70 to 80. That would yeah. be a, a good size, but uh, I think it's more of a dream this year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, everything's going to start somewhere, right? So, if you want to give us comments about the event, what you if you like what you're hearing, we're open to that. Well, you have all the information at the end of the show for how to contact us. We will probably be running a poll on uh, our Facebook page and maybe on Twitter too about the uh, the format of the event. If it's uh, one day or two, we're still working on that, and we want also to hear from the community what type of uh, duration you would like best yeah yeah obviously a one-day event might be easier for some people but two days lets you see maybe more people over the course of the weekend right yeah um oh maybe we should talk a little about we didn't mention this before we mentioned there are gonna be different types of classes uh but we didn't actually talk about what types of classes we've we've discussed mm-hmm. oh for sure so, so you we, already you know, mentioned use, osl yeah <laughs> yeah yomsl yeah um Antoine, I think we talked about having you teach uh, a couple different things. Uh, maybe some uh, uh, basic uh, metallics, like uh, doing uh, quick and dirty uh, true metallics. That's yeah. one of the things I do well. So if you're painting uh, dirty pigs like I do often, uh, <laughs> I, I have pretty much mastered the dirty look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, your metallics look really nice, though. I, I really like the, the way they come off on the table. Yeah. Um, and you know, we talked about weathering. Yes. So right? uh, we've approached uh, Guillaume Caval, if I remember his name correctly. So he won for the last two years the best of weathering at FIU in Quebec. So he, he knows his stuff. Yep, absolutely. So he's been approached. He, he He's interested. It all depends on the dates right now. Yeah. Uh, we have approached Maxime Croto, who's uh, another name. Uh, he's a painter from Quebec. He does a. He's already doing a lot of classes, intro classes to painting. So that's one thing he he really he's really good at getting people into painting, like getting gamers to a, a next level. So intermediate, he's good at uh, not really beginners, but at least uh, beginners to intermediate level to get them to better techniques and uh, mm. good grasp on some more advanced techniques. So yep. he's interested too. Uh, we've talked with uh, David Faust, who's a uh, he won the best of show uh, last year at last year in Quebec. In Quebec. Yeah. Uh, he placed in a multiple contest. He won the uh, one of the Color Tormond painting contests we ran back in the day at Ke- mm-hmm. Kies- uh, when we were doing Kiesledic. Color Tormond names come from that. We were running um, a monthly challenge painting. And during the first the first three Kiesledic, we also ran a painting contest at the same time. That was called Color Tormond. So that's where we're taking the name from. And David won one of those when it was uh, a Crystal Bush qualifier. Right. Yeah, so we have a lot of good ideas, and I think it'll be a a great way um, for people to, to learn some new techniques and improve what they know. And, and one of the things that always surprise me about ReaperCon, you know, don't underestimate the value of being able to sit in a room with a bunch of your peers painting. 
because while the guy two seats down for you may not be uh, David Faust or, or Mathieu Fontaine or Yom, he may still be better at you or have an interesting technique for doing something a certain way. So you will learn from everyone there, not just the instructors. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some guys might be master at speed painting armies. Like yep. tips on how to give uh, a really good level for the tabletop quickly. That doesn't really show. So, uh, uh, like super controlled uh, dry brush or something yep. like that. So, some or cheaty airbrushing. Yeah, cheaty airbrushing <laughs> or uh, uh, good, uh, good uh, edge highlighting, stuff like yep. that. So, everybody has something they can learn or they can share. Absolutely. All right. Um, and now we've also talked a little bit to it. Do we want to talk a bit about our our funding plans for this event? Yes. So we are still finalizing uh, the venue, the, the casting level, uh, talking with sponsors. Now, when we're aiming for the um, for fall, we don't have an exact date yet. It depends on the venue and everything. But to <laughs> running something like that costs money. <laughs> Yes. So we will have a deposit on the room paid once we uh, have finalized that. And we are looking at running uh, either an Ingo uh, Indiegogo or Kickstarter. So a crowdfunding uh, campaign to judge the interest level. So those that will, will run pr probably a pretty short one, probably three weeks maximum. Too, too long doesn't matter where we're, we're not uh, doing a, a giant game uh, we're not yeah, the next exactly. on this side <laughs> so but wouldn't it be will, nice <laughs> yeah wow yeah that will let us see if there's an interest and yeah. gauge if we have the at least the minimum level of interest to confirm uh, our location with the room uh, with the, the venue and to know if we are in the right direction and if not well uh, we'll have a painting weekend just for our guys and uh, we'll just be down or uh, prepayment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we'll lose uh, you know, the deposit on the, the venue and that's it. on the room and that's it. Yeah, exactly. So not not the end of the world. Yeah. Won't so break the bank. We will have uh, incentive on the Kickstarter, so, uh, probably some either uh, VIP swag bags or stuff like yeah. that. So uh, upgrade to the swag bags that everybody will get. You'll get a, a small, nicer version. Uh, let's say uh, instead of having a small pa <laughs> pot of paint, you might have a big one <laughs> or, or or a nicer brush or yeah. whatever. So one of the things we've talked about is including um, a, a paintbrush, a, a decent quality paintbrush in... Uh, Every swag bag, but the the VIP bag would have a, a Konsky sable brush. So like, good good upgrades and and good value mm -hmm. for the prepayment. So yeah. try to try to encourage people to sign up early. Yeah, or 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 all we we don't know yet if we'll have a single level or two level for like uh, the. The Kickstarter VIPs for people who want to have an upgrade and have their a lamp provided for them or whatever, have yeah. a, a class included or pre uh, uh, a first run at registering for classes once they go up or stuff like that. So we are working on the exact details and you should uh, hear about us uh, in the upcoming month. Yep. Yeah, we should. I think we'll probably have to move pretty quickly on this. So I think by the end of June, we'll have stuff hammered out in the Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, the Kickstarter shouldn't run uh, a lot later than early July. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I think we've uh, talked about uh, color ton monde enough. Yeah. yeah. So I pronounced it right that time, see? <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> not extra you. That's good. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, It's Check our silly, Facebook page. Silly French. Yeah. <laughs> two two words that basically mean the same thing but are different. <laughs> yeah. So check our Facebook page, check our Twitter feed uh, for the polls. We want to uh, hear, uh, fr uh, hear from you about the, the length of the event and whatever else you want to talk to us about. 
Uh, so we're open to any suggestion. It doesn't mean we'll listen, but at least we'll uh, we'll read them. <laughs> that was very diplomatic the way you said that. I approve. <laughs> uh, another thing, we've used uh, we a lot, and we is not only Paul and I. Uh, we're working with the old uh, Club Kiosk and Geeks of the Nerd crew. So um, yeah. The, in the group, there, there's a uh, Yom, uh, B. Steve, and also Papa Guillaume from Club Dia. So yeah. uh, it's the all, uh, all five of us are working on it. We don't want to exclude the other guys. <laughs> this is true. Well, we can exclude Guillaume a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, wait, no, we, we need him. Eh? Uh, okay, fine. Fine, Yom, you're back in. You're back in the band. <laughs> Man, I just love giving him stick. I don't know why. He's really a nice guy. Like, seriously, he's a nice guy. I just I just love giving him stick. All right. So, uh, next topic. <laughs> Speaking of Yom, how to find opponents. <laughs> I think I killed Antoine. <laughs> And you say a nice guy, and then you add that just after. You had to add a jab. <laughs> yeah. No, Yom is a good opponent. He he's just very focused, and I think he's easy to misread because he's he's super focused on the game. Yeah. People people take it as like he's you know super serious, you know, ultra hardcore. And I think it's this it's this way he concentrates. I actually had, and this this made me kind of chuckle because I had that same comment about uh, about B Steve just yesterday about how he's intimidating to play because he's like super like tournament focused like hardcore, and I'm like, well, yeah, but he's the friendliest win at all cost player we know, right? Friendliest yeah. whack player we know. <laughs> yeah, add the clock in any game, and uh, some people switch to uh, that. Yeah, or there absolutely. are people like you and I that just clocks ourselves and. <laughs> I forgot we were Still running a focus. clock yesterday. Put it that yeah. way. Yeah. I, I actually forgot the clock was running. Uh, you know, of course, I forget everything. I forgot the train was there. I forgot the scenarios was there. I forgot the... I was too busy focused on trying to figure out how, like, how my models worked. <laughs> I need to play more War Machine. Oh, well. Anyway, back on topic. How to find opponents. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways you can find opponents. Um... And it's not necessarily, it's a stupid topic, right? People are like, well, yeah. how hard can it be? Well, it's actually harder than you think because it's not just finding an opponent. You got to find opponents that are compatible. Or that play the game you want to play. Yeah, that's sure. the other thing. If, if you you're want... playing Warmaster, it's hard to find opponents, right? Yeah. Your, your, your pool of people to play against are limited. If you're playing 40K or, or War Machine, well, you've got a bigger pool to, to swim in, right? To look for someone that's more compatible. You can be pickier too. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, if I want to have a, a, War Mas a War Master game, I don't have much of a choice. We're three active player that I know in the old province. So <laughs> if I'm picky, I'm losing half of my opponents <laughs> right there. <laughs> That's yeah. True. True enough. Um, Okay, so let's look at. So we made a list. Or actually, we Antoine made a list of way of ways uh, that you can find players, and I, I I I read through it and agreed with them all. So there you go. Uh, I did something too. <clears throat> uh, so I like how first on his list is convert your friends. This is typically Antoine's strategy, by the way. <laughs> Random game X comes out. Antoine decides he needs to try it. It's it's usually Yomurai, I think, or the. Uh, are the the suckers of choice? Yes. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, on the whole, it's been pleasant experiences. We've played some really cool games. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and Yom tried out Relics and fell in love with with Relics from Tor Gaming. Yes. Um, what was that game you were playing with him? That that they did a Kickstarter. They had a a few different models, and you had the you, like you could leap from uh, point to point. It was a small skirmish game, three four models per side. Not the when they Roots of Kicks Magic. No, not Roots of Magic. That was the one you played with me, which is also a great game. Yeah. But there was another one. Uh, they did a Kickstarter. The 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 good guys were like a party of adventures. There was like a knight. There was oh, like a lizard uh, man. Blades. 
No like blades. That's it. And you guys had super fun with that. Yes, that right. was uh, really fun. Yeah. Uh, I I found back my cards uh, this week, so that's another <laughs> one we we need to play more. Right. And, and and that was the thing. Like so, you you find something and then you trick your friends into trying it. <laughs> yes, I do. Antoine is insidious, folks. He is insidious. Um, that that works for. Uh, small obscure games but even for main games if you don't have that many opponents yeah you could find friends that are not into miniature game yet and maybe they could get interested from the hobby side or, or the gaming side or even the fluff yep. side for games that have a deep fluff like a 40k or yeah. even war machine now with all the novels and everything so there's lots of ways yeah. to get people interested Well, I mean, 40K, the fluff is what originally got me interested in 40K. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it, it's not necessarily hard to convert your friends. Uh, the, let's face it, the models look cool. Oh, yes. That is half the reason we play these games, because the models look cool. The tables look cool. Yes. Um, I, I think when you plan properly, it's easy to convert friends. At least to try. Yeah. Maybe not invest in them, but uh, I know some people who have two armies for a game, and they have friends who don't own any model, but they still play with them once in a while. It just they, yeah, they go for army. lighter games, and they provide everything, and at least they have a, a opponents to play with. Yep, that's true. Um, the the next obvious one is local stores. Obviously, if you've got a local gaming store, going there to find gamers makes a lot of sense. Um. And the good thing about stores, they attract a lot of different people. So you will find different types of gamers um, at every store. And there'll be different different groups and different play styles. And it's going to be easy or easier um, to see how people interact because you can watch them play, right? Mm -hmm. So you can watch, go up to like, go to the store on like their 40K night or War Machine night. And you can pick, you know, okay, yeah, that person is super competitive and that's how I want to play. So that's someone I, I want to play with. Uh, you know, that person is super casual. He seems like a nice guy, but, you know, it's not how I want to play the game or vice versa, right? You know, that person seems super hardcore and that's really intimidating. I'd rather play someone who's really casual. Yeah. Um, depends so, on what you're looking for. Yep. Yeah, it depends on what you're looking for. But because you can see them in, it's a target rich environment, because you can see them playing the game you can kind of get a good impression uh, or a good idea, I should say, of, of what they're going to be like mm -hmm. and whether or not you want to approach them and try to, you know, find you know, find a game with them or play a game with them. And we mentioned local stores. It's mostly because uh, being in North America, the yeah. we're more of a store culture. But That's true. if you were going to uh, the UK Europe. or other places yeah. in Europe, I know gaming clubs are more the type of place you would looking for for the, the sim, a similar experience. Yeah, that's that's very true. It's funny how that works, ain't eh? Like, the UK is the, the 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 mecca of the hobby, right? Uh, and yet here, we play very differently. Mm -hmm. It is all centered around stores. There aren't really clubs, per se. Um, and, and I think it's possibly because we just have a, a thing against paying for playing spaces in North America. That, and I think we just have more space. That's true too, right? In in England, um, you know, space is at a premium, especially if you're like in London and stuff, you don't have a ton of space. So finding a place where you can set up a, a four by eight table to play a giant 40 K game is not necessarily easy. Uh, and I think also, uh, there's a more of a club culture, Not just around the abyss, but around yeah, other stuff too. In general. So people are used to be part of a club to run hobbies or uh, activities. Yeah. No, that's that's a fair assessment, I think. Like uh, here, getting a, a room for a club would be a pain. I don't know where I, I'll go for that. Yeah, see, in, in Montreal, I don't know. What you'd have to do here is like rent a, a church basement or mm -hmm. uh, like a Legion hall, do a monthly, like, you know, or, or biweekly thing at the Legion, but it would be tough and it would be expensive. Yes. Right. And, and that's, that's the thing, getting people to pay money to have a place to play 
when they get free space at stores. At a stores, or they'll just play at home. Yeah, and most like the, home the, the, are big enough to have a, yeah. a playing space. Yeah, Don't underestimate the basement gamer, right? Yep. I, I found that here in the West Island, where I live, in the West Island, Montreal, uh, people don't want to go to the stores. They'd rather just play at home. Mm-hmm. It's it's really uh, interesting. Um, uh, Facebook groups. So finding the a Facebook group for the game you play uh, will definitely help you track down players uh, for that game. Yeah, either that or the other way around. You look for uh, localized Facebook groups. So one one yeah, thing absolutely. we have here is tabletop uh, Montreal tabletop gamers. So it's yep. a generic group for everybody who play miniatures games or uh, miniature Rive Sud, which is uh, a Google Plus uh, group. Oh, I didn't know. What so that I mentioned was. Facebook. So even I learned something. Uh, other stuff. Yeah, uh, other uh, social apps do it too. Yeah, and and meetups work were the same way. Yeah, so yeah, meetups uh, work uh, like that as well. There's a, a 40k meetup in Montreal. There's a board game group meetup that's very popular. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, for most most games, there's pretty big Facebook communities. Yes, you know, if you look at uh, if you look at War Machine, right. Not only are the generic War Machine ones, but there's all the faction ones. Every faction's got a Facebook group. Yep. So um, there, there's lots of places to explore and look for opponents and find try to find people in your area. And even if you don't find someone to play against, they you may find someone who knows where you can look. Mm-hmm. You, you might not be aware of some stores near you or some uh, more basement clubs. So... And you could learn from those groups or yeah. learn of local events that are in a drivable distance. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um. Because let's be honest, most of the events in store don't don't market that well. No, that's true. That's true. It's funny. Gaming stores are great places to find opponents and find models, but they don't market themselves very well. It seems like the, the one thing I've noticed about all gaming stores well, the majority of gaming stores. There's one. There's one on the South Shore that's doing a fairly aggressive marketing campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, but generally speaking, gaming stores don't advertise themselves very well. It's kind of a shame. But it's a really niche market, so it's hard to advertise for it too. So yeah, it's hard to get a return on investment, right? Yeah. Um, company forums. You know, now it depends on the company. Yes, yeah, some companies no longer have forums. <laughs> Yes, or they have forums, but no one's in them. Um, mm-hmm. And community pages run by the company. We can say, put that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, the company forums can be a good place to, to source source players and learn a little bit about your local meta and uh, what local events are running. Yeah. The, Not um, all games have forums anymore. It no, was a true. thing back in the day, so... You can still yeah. find some for some game, but uh, I think it's well, uh, on the way down. Yeah, well, forums are. I I don't think of forums in like as in the old bulletin board systems we used to use. Right, I think forums just a as a generic term for any place you can communicate with other players. Uh, you know, fa- the Facebook groups are essentially a forum with yeah, a sure. poor search engine yeah. and impossible to follow threads. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the main difference. <laughs> that's why yeah. I like forums still. Yeah, and I know it's it's the way of the dodo, um, and and I get that. But you know, I said there's still some forums that do well. You know, Daka Daka, uh, Bolter and Chainsword, they still have really active communities, and they've been around forever. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's because they're all filled with old people like us, or what? <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But you know they're they're still doing they're still going strong. Uh, for War Machine and Hordes, there's a, there's a new forum that opened up that it, it seemed to have a decent start. I don't know if it's still going strong, which was Lorba Hordes. Yeah, it, it went up when the um, PB forum was on pause while they were uh, reworking yeah. it. Yeah, and then it just became more permanent when the the PB forums became changed. Yeah, I was gonna say less hospitable. Uh, anyway, that's uh. 
topic for another show. The Lost uh, Show. Yeah, The Lost Show. Where you and I yelled at each other. <laughs> um, where we politely agreed to disagree. There. Uh, local events. That's the other thing. So you use all these other uh, methods to try to find local events. So local events will, again, just like the gaming store, let you see a large section of the community and, you know, maybe help you decide what style you want to play, Mm -hmm. like how you want to play the game and let you find players to play against. Yeah. I think thing an event is, uh, especially if it's not uh, a store one, but uh, just a, a bit bigger than that, you'll either if you attend as a player or just go a, 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 and watch. But even as a player, it's worth it because you meet new people that you have never played against, mm-hmm. and well, that that's the that's the way. First, when we when I was back in Victoriaville when we started playing, we went to Evan in Montreal in Quebec and we met a lot of people that way that we would have never met outside of that. Absolutely, that are friends now, and even not necessarily local. Um, I mean, or even conventions, yeah, yeah. So, like my buddy Ben, who went to Adepticon last year, and didn't really have the intention of playing. He just went to kind of check it out and see what people were like and, and to see the game as played and to kind of get an idea of what the meta might be like. Um, because you can like a game on paper, but then to see it played, find out it's it's really not what you thought, right? Mm-hmm. Or not your style. Yep. And I, and I think some games change drastically on paper versus uh, the reality of of how the game is played live. Mm-hmm. You know, 40K is a great example of that. If you look at 7th edition, you read the rule book, it doesn't seem bad. Oh, you can do some allies. Oh, it's got some neat ideas. And, but then you see where the community has taken that in, in terms of a competitive event anyway. And it, it's a very big departure from what most people read when they read the book. Yeah. Right? So it can be a, almost a culture shock when you, when you get to see that game played that way. Um. Especially if you're a fluff bunny, mm-hmm. you know, if you're like me and you're all about the fluff and stuff and you, you know, why is that guy running Imperial Knights with Eldar and a Tau Riptide? Like, what is going on? I don't understand, you know? <laughs> um, so I can give you some insights into how you want to play the game because not only finding opponents, but picking the right opponents is is a big deal because not having the right opponents will, can will make the game less fun. Yeah. Yeah. It could make even you dislike the game. Yeah, I, I mean, I uh, for a long time, I had a pretty big hate on for War Machine uh, because I, I just had so many bad games in a row. Um, I, I just decided that, you know, the community was terrible and I wasn't going to play the game anymore. And then I started hanging out with you guys and I got to play with you. And I got to play with Yom, and despite playing with Yom, I, I still figured I liked the game. Um, <laughs> man, I'm really like digging it. Yom today is terrible. He's gonna think it's because we played last night. He's gonna like be all like, did, did I did I do something wrong? Did I? He's gonna be all scarred. <laughs> I'm gonna feel bad. It's like that time I played 40k with him, and then and then we kept trying to play another game, and I, I couldn't get the schedule to work, and he literally thought I was dodging him. <laughs> I made him all paranoid about it. He thought he'd really done something to offend me. Poor guy. Um, yeah. So I, I think. Did, did we kind of go over everything we wanted to talk about? Or? Yeah, I think that rounds it up. If you have other ideas, uh, please share with us. Stuff yeah, that we, would be great. Uh, we mentioned if, uh, or forgot. If you can think of a way to, to, to find opponents that we didn't mention, that'd be awesome. Uh, send it to us on Facebook or tweet it to us or uh, message us on our, our, I was going to say on our webpage. We don't have a webpage anymore because it exploded. Yeah, but uh, the, the new Can they website still comment on the shows? On comments, the... yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I guess that's going to be about uh, two hours of painting nonsense. By this point, everyone's either gone to sleep or gotten tired of painting. 
So we should probably wrap it up, Antoine. Yes. Um, do you have any shout outs? Yeah, you'd I like have to? two. Okay. So uh, it's two podcasts I've started listening in the past two, three months, maybe a bit more. Uh, first one is Obby Night in Canada. They do a podcast. Awesome name, by the way. It's pretty similar to us in format. They talk a lot about uh, the hobby side, not just gaming, but they do uh, they do both. They talk about gaming. They talk about hobby. They talk about a ton of game systems. However, they talk about that boring Battletech game too much, and they ate Guild Ball. So they're kind of a nemesis because of that. Boring Battletech? You mean like classic Battletech? yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, that takes me back. Yeah. Let me get my but, pencil and I can fill all those little circles in. <laughs> that, that's just to poke, to poke at Tom <laughs> and all the other guys. Uh, it's really fun. Uh, I like their format too. They, uh, they have uh, periods, per- first period, second period, which are their topics. Okay, nice. Yeah, so it's, it's a fun show. It's a fun listen to. Uh, really lively guys. I, I that must confuse the Americans though. They don't uh, probably maybe don't get the, they don't get the reference. <laughs> yeah, and the, even even the intro tune is based on the uh, Obi Night and uh, uh, Okinawa Canada, Canada old, song. Uh, yeah, yeah, old nice. intro. So it's fun. And the other podcast is Paint All the Minis. So it's an interview podcast that interviews hobbyists at large. It interviews uh, everyday guys. It interview company guys. Uh, old uh, old designers but there is always a, a first part which is an intro about the person what they do what they do in the, the industry if they are part of the industry and nice. the rest is question about painting it's all about the hobby side uh, how they got into gaming uh, how they got into painting what type of painting they prefer uh, scale color what type of miniatures so it's really interesting to listen especially because of the variety of uh, the diversity of the people he got, he, he gets on the show. I'm totally going to have to add that to my, uh, my podcatcher. Yeah. It, it's a pretty, uh, recent edition. I think it's, a uh, it's around at around 20 shows released and it released every week and sometimes two times a week. So, yeah. Well, for us, 20 shows could be like three years. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, just to mention paint all the minis is also, uh, there's also a Facebook group associated to it, which is open to all level of painters just to share. The goal is to share and to be positive about the the all the, the, the podcast and the group is all about positiveness and sharing. So whoa, it, it's whoa, really whoa. fun. Well, positive gamers? Yeah. No, painters. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I know a lot of painters, dude. It's it's a pretty drama filled uh, hobby, so mm-hmm. I'm skeptical. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm part of a group. I've been part for a, a little while now. Uh, I really like. I really like the the show. I really like Dan the host, the main host. I I I really like the the core group on the the Facebook group. It's fun. Lots of sharing. Lots of information. Lots of positive comments. So, it's hey, I'm really in that interesting. Group. How am I in that group? But I never get updates from it. How weird <laughs> is that? I've got notifications set off. That is so strange. But looking through this, it is all filled with, with wondrous little painting things. I'm going to have to check this out. And that's it for me. So we'll have uh, links to, their, to those two podcasts and the Facebook group for Paint All the Minis too. But uh, they're, they're not hard to find. Paint All the Minis or Obby Night in Canada. So too simple, easy to find in your podcast listener. All right. Anything Dude. you wanted to uh, mention, Paul? No, I'm I'm good. I've made fun of Yom several times. Uh, I got some podcasts to listen to. I think that's a show. Well, that's good. <laughs> that checks all the boxes for me, man. Made fun of Yom. Got some new podcasts. Excellent. <laughs> all right, Antoine. So I'll let you go, and uh, we'll get together in a couple weeks and do this again. Bye, geeks. Thanks for listening to Geeks of the North. If you want to contact us, you can email us at geeksofthenorth at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash geeksofthenorth or follow us on Twitter at geeksofthenorth. 
You can follow me, Paul, at PR Filio, Antoine at El Tonio Berg, Steve at B underscore Steve. And if you really feel the need, I guess you can follow Yom. He's at Yomasta. Breaks and outro music by Ladrave. You can listen to them at ladrave.bandcamp.com. See you next time, geeks. Thank you for checking out United Geeks Network family member. If you enjoyed it and are looking for other online media with a geek culture slant, head over to unitedgeeksnetwork.com where you will find the Gaming Careers Podcast, the resource for people looking to find their fit in the gaming industry. You will hear game industry professionals talk about how they succeed in today's competitive environment and how you can do the same. The United Geeks Network. You can broadcast your geekiness at unitedgeeksnetwork.com. Work.com. 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 Work.com.